I'm sure this is not going to come to a, as a surprise to you, but I love church, right? Most pastors probably do. Now, I've loved every church I've been a part of, but First Church has some incredible things to celebrate. When we talk about this mission statement of, of leaving a spiritual legacy for the next generation, that's, that's an incredible part of who we are. To the kind of almost laser focus we have as a congregation on how we can feed the hungry in our own community and world. We are blessed with some incredible staff. We are blessed with some incredible volunteers. And if you didn't know it, we have some of the best musicians in the area as part of our church. Sometimes, though, the, the best sign of it being a great church aren't things we can specifically point to and quantify, right? Sometimes it's, it's more of a feeling. I often tell people that I think the best churches are the ones that when you walk in the door, you just feel welcome and comfortable, right? But you can't take that too far. Like, when I first started in ministry, my boys were pretty young. And I remember one night that I had to, to go to a committee meeting, and I had to take the boys with me. And my youngest was three, maybe four years old. And we arrive at the church, and he gets in the front door, and in the foyer, he kicks his shoes off. And then he takes a mad dash towards the nursery. Coat goes one direction, off comes the shirt, and he goes the other direction. You are way too comfortable in church, buddy. <laughs> I even remember one night when, when we were doing youth ministry and uh, we had the kids gathering on a Sunday night and for a special Bible study and, and one of the girls was running late. She had just come from track practice and she gets into the building and she tries to take her sweatpants off. She's got her gym shorts on underneath and I am not thinking and in my own way, I shout across the building. I said, Michaela, put your pants back on. And all of a sudden, all these women from a women's Bible study stick their head out the door like, what is going on out here? Yeah, maybe a little too comfortable. <laughs> the thing is, when we talk about the church, we so often limit ourselves in what we think. We may talk about the activities, we may talk about the location, but the concept of church, it's, it's meant to be much, much bigger. Actually, when we use the word church in our modern language, it's very different from where it began in scripture. That's why today we start this new sermon series called Think Big. And how maybe even our concept of the church is too small and we can have this wider vision. See, when the, when the early church thought about church, when early Christians talked about it, it wasn't about a building or pews. They certainly weren't talking about a liturgy or hymnals or committees. We, we sing songs like we are the church, right, and, and have this idea that the church is the people. And there's part of us that identifies with that concept, but we don't always talk about it that way. You might give directions to someone and say, you go up to the church and you turn right. We talk about a location. <laughs> or we tell people, I went to church this week and we meant a worship service. Now, all of those things are part of church, but little by little we start to limit what church really is. The thing is, in the Bible, the church was a movement. <laughs> a movement that was sparked by, by one event in history, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, there are other religions that, that talk about this Jesus, and, and some say, well, he was a good man. Some say he was a great moral teacher. Some look at Jesus and say, well, maybe he was a prophet, or maybe he was this great miracle worker. But on that first Easter morning, when the tomb was empty, it was clear. Jesus is the Messiah, the God incarnate. And the resurrection, it, it led to this group of eyewitnesses who were willing to give everything for the gospel. You know, tradition holds that of the 12 disciples, of course, Judas took his own life, but 10 of the other 11 died as martyrs. We... We often hear in our society how as Christians, we believe in something that may not have happened. Like, how do you even know the resurrection is true? 
And then I look at these men and I go, how can it not be? I, I mean, they didn't get new power. They didn't get new privilege in society. They were mocked and beaten, arrested and killed for the gospel. Wow. Oh, who would do that for something they knew wasn't true? See, the church was, was different then. <laughs> No facility, no staff, no programs, just a mission. And it got big, fast. This movement, it, it shook up the status quo, and it, and it reshaped society. Everything changed because of Christ's church. I mean, I'm not sure that's the way the world views the church anymore. I'm not sure that's the way we view the church anymore. So what happened, right? What, what changed in history to make this? And to really understand, maybe, maybe we can start with the word itself, all right? In youth group just a couple weeks ago, we shared with a part of the lesson, we shared that the very first person to use the word church in Scripture was Jesus himself. <laughs> Now, the story actually comes from the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 16. And Jesus has been doing all these miracles and, and healing people, feeding the 5,000. But they have an evening where it's just the disciples. They finally get this moment apart. And Jesus looks at them and says, who do people say that I am? And they do what a lot of us would do, right? Like somebody says, who's that? And you go, oh, well, give them their name. Or, or you say, oh, well, they do this, right? And that's how the disciples start. Jesus says, who do people say that I am? And they start and they say, some people say Moses, some people say Elijah, some people say you're a prophet, right? I just caught this this week. Chapter 17 is the story of the transfiguration where they're on the mountain. <laughs> and who shows up? Moses and Elijah, right? Oh, clearly that's not who Jesus is. But then Jesus changes the question. He looks at them and says, who do you say that I am? asking for someone else's opinion. We're not, we're not talking about gossip. Who do you say that I am? And Peter, who, who has this habit of talking and then thinking, sometimes it, it kind of shoots him in the foot, but this time he was spot on, and he looks at Jesus and says, you are the Messiah. Very first time in Scripture that anyone has called him the Messiah. The thing is, Jesus looks at Peter and he says, I tell you, you Peter, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Jesus says, on you I will build the church, right? And everything changes. So, obviously, Peter thought, well, on me, the church is going to be built, so I'm going to be the foundation for a building, right? I'm going to be the foundation for some organization. No, that's not what it's about. And it's not that Jesus made up a word here, right? It's not like he used a word that had never been used before. And the, the New Testament was originally written in Greek. And so in the Greek language, the word that he used is ecclesia, okay? Uh, here's the the way that it's spelled in Greek, the way that we spell it in English. But the reality is the word meant an assembly or a gathering. See, Jesus looked at Peter and he said, on you will be the foundation of the church. On you will be the foundation of this gathering, this assembly, this movement. But then things shifted, right? Right? By about 300 A.D., Christianity wasn't just a religion in the Middle East. It had spread. And the center of Christianity started to shift towards Europe. And so in Europe, they started talking about this Jesus and this idea of church in their own language. And the term that started to catch on came from the Gothic or the, or the Germanic language, and it was dekir, the Lord's house. Catch the shift? 
It was the gathering, and now it's the house. Now, I'm not suggesting that, that it's because of the language we think of church different. I think it points that even as early as 300 A.D., the church started thinking too small. Christians started talking about church as the building, the location, and missed the real meaning. It was about a place instead of a people. It was about an institution instead of a movement. But you may have noticed today's scripture doesn't actually use the term church at all, right? But it does talk about this idea of church as a movement. If you have a Bible and you look at this section, the title on top is probably called The Ascension, right? And that's typically what we focus on when we look at this scripture. We look at it and we go, that's when Jesus was taken back up into heaven through this great cloud, and that's where we get this imagery of, of heaven being on a cloud somewhere, right? But it's also this incredible mission statement that Jesus leads. And we have to set the stage a little bit, right? Right? Jesus rose from the dead. <laughs> and for 40 days, this resurrected Christ has been appearing to people and spreading this gospel message and sharing this love. And in case you didn't know it, anytime you see 40 in Scripture, pay attention because something big is about to happen. Right? Something's about to change and shift. You look back to the story of Noah, 40 days and nights it rained. You look at the, the story of the Israelites, they wandered in the desert for 40 years. You look at Jesus after his baptism, he spent 40 days in the wilderness before his ministry began. And something was about to happen. The disciples, they knew it. <laughs> they could feel it, right? And so they come together and they think this must be the time that everything's going to change. And so they asked Jesus, they asked him, he said, is this when you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel, right? They're thinking, you're resurrected, you must be invincible now, let's go free ourselves. Let's get away from the Romans and let's become this powerful institution of Israel. Jesus says that's never been the point, Right? And instead, he gives them this new mission statement in verse 8. He says, but you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Can you imagine being the disciples in this moment? I don't, I don't know how you picture it, if it's, if it's just the 11 of them or, or if it's this crowd of 100, I, I don't know, but they must have been so excited, right? Can you imagine the excitement as they come to this site knowing that something big is going to happen? And then Jesus speaks. Jesus says, all right, here's the game plan. Here's what we're going to do. I remember in high school, when I was a, a, a freshman in high school, uh, our team, our football team, won the state championship. I don't want to mislead you. I was a terrible football player. I didn't play a single game in the playoffs that year. But I remember we were at one of these games, and we were trailing. We were the underdog, and it was the fourth quarter. It was fourth down. We were losing. And I hear the coach say, huddle up. And I'm excited. I know I'm not going to play, but I want to be in this huddle. <laughs> I want to hear what the game plan is. I want to hear how everything's going to change. Ah, I think that's the excitement the disciples must have felt. And, and so they come in and everybody huddles up and he says, but I will give you, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And I'm guessing they're excited, right? This Holy Spirit, I've heard about this. Last time you talked about the Holy Spirit, we could do miracles. This is going to be awesome, right? And then he says, and you will be my witnesses Okay, yeah, we got to tell people about Jesus. This is going to be awesome. I love this game plan. In Jerusalem, and they're like, I mean, it's a big town, but okay, yeah, we can do this. And he says, and Judea, and they go, the whole country? <laughs> I mean, Jesus, you haven't even visited every community in the country. Are you sure about this? And then he says, and Samaria, and they're like, wait a minute, Jesus, we don't even like to go to Samaria. <laughs> Those people, they're different than us. 
and to the ends of the earth. Wow, it got big fast, right? And this week I, I kept trying to picture how it must have been different. How their walk out from Jerusalem that morning, the, the excitement they must have felt, this, this great game plan that Jesus is going to give us. And then they get the game plan and we're supposed to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth and then Jesus leaves. How different it must have felt to walk home. How overwhelmed they must have felt. There's a part of me that goes, I, I don't know if I can understand how overwhelmed they must have felt, but maybe there are times we get it. Sometimes we feel overwhelmed as well. Sometimes I, I turn on the news and I, I hear about the brokenness in this world, and I go, I don't know, I don't know what to do. We feel overwhelmed at the idea of sharing our faith. Have you ever been, have you ever been sitting with a group of people and, and you feel this nudge from God, this nudge from the Holy Spirit that you're supposed to talk about your religion, and you go, but I'm not comfortable with that. That feels pretty overwhelming. Maybe we understand exactly how the disciples felt. We come to church because we know it's important. Because we know it matters to be around God's people and to celebrate together. We even know it's good for other people, but we don't always know what to do about it. And as humans, when we get overwhelmed, we, we tend to retreat, both emotionally and sometimes physically. And by 300 AD, the church started to retreat inside their own walls. They became inwardly focused. I don't mean that to sound judgmental, because I do it as well. But we start to play it safe. And somewhere along the way, the church moved from being a movement became a static place. Instead of taking the gospel to the world, we started inviting the world to come see us. Church became about a worship service or programs or staff. And don't get me wrong, I, I think most churches are inviting, and they need to be, right? Both, both literally and figuratively. First Church strives to be excellent in those areas. The events we have for the community, the welcome team that greets you at the door, the way we care for this facility, the letter that, that Micah shared, all of those are signs about this hospitality, this invitation that we give, and those are important. But it was never meant to be a replacement for taking the gospel to the world. One of my favorite authors is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was a, a pastor from Germany during the Second World War. And one of the big pieces that he talks a lot about is how the church has to go out. The church has to be this movement again that changes the world. But the Nazis didn't like that message, and they arrested him. They eventually killed him. But just like, just like Paul and the epistles we have, Bonhoeffer decided this is a chance for me to share. And so he started writing these letters to everyone he could think of to share this message of Jesus and the gospel. And one of those letters he wrote this, he said, the church is the church only when it exists for others. Not dominating, but helping and serving. It, the church, must tell men of every calling that it, what it means to live for Christ, to exist for others. Scary, right? Feels overwhelming. And there are times we, we just don't feel like we're equipped <laughs> the way we want to be. 
Maybe you've had those times. This was one of those weeks that I, I didn't know if I was really equipped for this thing called ministry. How do we handle those situations, right? How many of you have heard the saying, how do you eat an elephant, right? With hot sauce because they taste terrible? No. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. I wonder if Jesus understood that as well. You notice his mission tape statement doesn't start, go and change the world. It says, be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and that's where he starts. So what's your Jerusalem? What's your first sphere of influence where you can easily share the gospel? Is it your, your family? Is it your friends? Is it your coworkers? If so, that's where you are called to start sharing the gospel. But it can't end there, right? Here's a challenge for you. I want you guys this week to take some notes, whether it's getting out a piece of paper, typing it on your computer, putting it on the notes on your phone, but I I really encourage you to honestly think about this and do this, right? Who is your Jerusalem? And start listing some names. And if you write those names down and you go, well, yeah, that's my family and that's my friends, but most of them are already Christians, so I guess I'm done. No, then it's time to talk about your Jerusalem, Go from your Jerusalem to your Judea. And you say, who are the groups that I'm a part of? What are the organizations that I'm a part of? And where can I share the gospel there? And maybe you look at that and go, I think I'm doing all right with that. And, And so maybe your next step is, what's your Samaria? What are those places that you don't really want to go, but you know maybe you should? God reminded me of that this week. See, sometimes I I focus on my Jerusalem or I I focus on my Judea and I think I'm done, but there's this Samaria. (laughs) On Friday, someone from this church invited me to go do jail ministry with them. It's a ministry I've never really felt comfortable with. And so we took a tour and I started to meet some of the 160 inmates in our local jail. And God said, there's your Samaria. I I did foster care. I have extended family members who have been incarcerated. And all of a sudden, there was this moment in my mind that I went, How could their lives look different if someone like me had went into the jail and made a difference in their lives? Who's your Jerusalem? Who's your Judea? Where's your Samaria? When we talk about changing the world, it it feels so overwhelming, but maybe it doesn't have to. Maybe this movement that changes the world can start with our little sphere. Here's the thing. The church started as a movement. The Reformation started as a movement. Methodism started as a movement. First church started as a movement. What's God calling us to move next? Who's your Jerusalem? Who's your Judea? Who's your Samaria? We understand those. If if we approach those, then maybe, maybe this thing called church can still change the world. Amen? Would you pray with me? Loving and gracious God, 
we confess that there are times this mission of the church feels too big. There are times that, that we start to retreat, both emotionally and physically, into the comfort of our walls. Oh, but your, your vision, your mission, your, your movement called the church was meant to be so much more. God, we ask you to empower us once again to recognize and remember that, that even if we weren't there on the day of the ascension, the mission is still the same. God, we ask you to, to pour out your Holy Spirit on us just like you did those early disciples. We ask you, God, that, that by your Spirit you make us one with Jesus and, and one with each other. That you make us one in ministry to this, this whole world. And God, when that feels overwhelming, help us to just serve our Jerusalem or Judea. We ask you, God, that, that you would do all of this until, until that promise is fulfilled and until Jesus comes again in his final victory. Until we all get to feast at your heavenly banquet. We ask all of this, God, through the name of your Son, Jesus who with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, we give all honor and glory to you, almighty God, now and forever. Amen.